God and Holy Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence here today, Lord. And we believe, Lord, you are here because you have promised in your word where two or three or more are gathered in your name. There you are in our midst. Lord, we are holy and completely dependent upon you, Lord, today, Lord, that you might manifest yourself here in a way that we would be drawn to you, that we might look upon your beauty, that we might know you, and that we might have life. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. This morning, I would like to bring up a question, a question that I think is a, a very central question to our faith. Um, I've heard it asked uh, in many different ways, but I'm going to put it in a simple form. Why did God create? Why all of this? Why didn't God just stay in the state, that perfect state that he was, uh, before anything else was created? And I don't want to drag this out too long, but uh, I think I've taken a topic that I can't answer or I can't really speak adequately to in one sermon, so I'm going to take a couple of sermons to do that. But I don't want to leave you hanging. This isn't like the nightly news that they leave those little teasers about what's coming up. And so I'll give you a simple answer that we're going to build on as we go. And the answer is God created for his glory. God created for his glory. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it tells us that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. And Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Again, and if I'm going too fast with the scriptures, uh, you don't necessarily have to turn there, but, um, you know, I am reading them. <laughs> And uh, I, I don't expect you to turn there, but I, I want you to, to just let the words sink in. And you can always go back and find it later. But in Isaiah 43, 7, God speaks of everyone who is called by his name, whom he has created for his glory, for his glory. And finally, Colossians 1, 16 tells us that all things were created by him and for him. Now, I don't want us to get confused with those scriptures and what I'm saying. Because God was perfect in and of himself. He was not lonely. He didn't have any needs that were unfulfilled. So God did not create in order to get something for himself. He created out of love that he might display himself to someone outside of himself. That's an act of love. And the reason why he did that is because he is so wonderful. And that's what we're going to start with today. We're going to talk about who God is and why it's so important that he display himself. How is that such a benefit to us that God would display himself? Sometimes I think we get caught up in the idea of worship. We're just saying nice things about God. You know, that's not true worship. True worship is when you see nice things about God and then you respond to them. How can we get up here or how can you sit down there or go out on the street and praise God when you don't know him? You know, that's the kind of uh, shallow and uh, uh, invaluable kind of, or without value, I should not, not invaluable, without value. When someone just says something good about you, just, you know, to be, you know, uh, someone who's kissing up to you. Oh, you're doing great in school. And I have never seen your grades, right? You know, uh, talking about all the things that you're doing that I, I know nothing about. And I'm just flattering you for some purpose of mine. God's not impressed with that. And that's not God's purpose in creation. God wants to reveal himself, to display himself, so that we can see his glory. That we can participate in the divine nature in that sense. That we come to know who God is. God wants that for us. So God created out of love, not to benefit himself. 
I want to go beyond this simple question and answer to explore more deeply some of the ramifications of that question. It's a simple question, why did God create? But there are a lot of other questions that derive from that question. Why did God make Satan? If he knew he was going to fall, if he knew he was going to turn evil, why did God make him in the first place? That's part of the question. Why did God create? And the simple answer is, for his glory. Why did God create Satan if he knew he was going to fall? For his glory. That's the simple answer. Why does God allow evil in the world? He allows evil for some time. That's definitely true. Why do I say that? Because God's in control. So if God doesn't allow it, it doesn't happen. Why does God allow evil? The short answer? For his glory. For his glory. And that's why I want to lay down a foundation for some of the uh, statements I'm going to make later because some of these things seem weird. They seem uh, unacceptable because we're talking about a holy God. How could he do this simply for his glory? Well, simply for his glory is the problem. It's not simply. God's glory is the whole ball of wax. Knowing God, that is the thing that's worthwhile. It's not a side issue. In our worship, when we come and we read the word of God, it is to come to know God. You know, I, I thought of an old illustration I'd used once um, where I, I got it from somebody else, so I didn't make it up. But, you know, a, a, a young boy got a telescope from his, his dad, and he was so excited. He loved it. His father wanted him to be able to explore the stars. And so the boy took the telescope up to his room, and he began to take it apart. And he was measuring the lenses and the, the tubes and how they uh, extended out far. And uh, he even took apart the tripod. And, and he came back to his father all excited. Oh, I know so much about this telescope. I know intimate details about this telescope. And he began to explain to his father all the things he learned. And his father went up to his room and he saw this telescope in pieces on the floor. He said, that's not what this telescope is for. You're supposed to look through this telescope and see the stars. You see the galaxies. You use this telescope to look through it. And then you see a wondrous world that you can't see otherwise. And that's what the Bible is. The Bible is a, a way of magnifying the Lord so we can see him. It's the word of God so that we can know who God is. It's not just to tear it apart and look at things and talk about all the stuff we learned from it. Do you see God? Do you see God when you read this word? Do you come to know him? If you're not, you're misusing it. You're not understanding it. The whole purpose is coming here, even us together, even me coming here to speak. It's not to entertain you. It's so that we can come to know God together. And you see, we can't always do that alone. Because God has created for two purposes in a way. One, so that we might know him. He's displaying ourselves, his self to us, to each one of us. But he's also using us to display himself to others. You ever go to one of those... Um, Theater dinners where uh, you sit down and you eat, but you're watching a play and you're part of the play? Well, if you haven't, you, maybe you never even heard of it. But there is such a thing. You know, you're part of the play. You're not an actor, but you are an actor. So you're sitting there and you're eating your meal and you're watching, but they make you a part of the play. God has made us part of the play. Right from the beginning, we were created in the image of God. In the image of God. To reflect his glory. We come here. We were talking this uh, Wednesday about worship. And I don't want to get into the details of what we were saying about the worship. Because, you know, you can take one side or the other. But it's very clear God wants us to display our faith. God wants us to display the knowledge of him that he has put in us. It's not something just to keep 
holding in quietly and by ourselves to know God ourselves and sit quiet in the corner. I know God. Yes, that's part of it. You need to know God. And then you need to be part of his display. We are platforms for the display of God's glory. God reveals himself to us so that we can display his glory. He wants us to display his glory. He's called us to display his glory. Can I get an amen? <laughs> God is great, and he's greatly to be praised. Why? Because he is great. Worship is a natural response to knowing God. If you knew how great he was, you wouldn't keep quiet. We were talking before. I said, you know what? If you hit the lottery and you, you're one of these people who plays the lottery all the time and uh, you hit $50, you hit $100 and somebody says, oh, uh, honey, I, I hit the lottery. Oh, good. Man, what do you hit? A couple hundred dollars? Well, it's a couple million dollars. Well, that changes the whole thing. That changes the whole thing. Oh, I know God and you have a small little God. That's no big deal. But we have a huge God. We have a huge God who can't be measured. He's infinite in his greatness. Sometimes we need to stop and shout, God is good all the time. Amen. And it's not because we're uh, charismatic. We don't want to be charismatic because you know what? Sometimes what happens is you get people shouting and screaming about God in ways they don't even know God. They just love to get up and dance, so they dance. They love to shout, and they love to bring attention to themselves. But that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to bring attention to God. We don't need any fake miracles. God is a miracle worker. He does real miracles. God is good. So I want to go beyond the, the, the simple question of why did God create and talk about some of those um, questions that come up uh, out of that. In studying our topic, I'll do my best to remember that not every question, not every question that you have and not every question that I have can be answered. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And there are some questions. There are some things that we wonder about. And I don't want to get into a big speculation about stuff that God hasn't spoken on. Because I think that's where you really go wrong. And I've heard a lot of, uh, you know, speculation about things that will just help us understand where you got that from. Is that from the Bible? You know, I have a sister that I, uh, I have to say, well, she's not a Christian, but she says she's a Christian. But she's actually in uh, something of a new age type of faith. And she says things, and I... Once they asked her, well, where do you get this image of God that you have? You know, I can tell you where uh, what I know about God comes from. It comes from the word of God. Where is it that you get this stuff from? And she can't really answer that question because it's made up, either in her own mind or other people's minds. You can make up anything you want about God. But I think that we have to be grounded in the word of God and not go beyond what the word says. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to find a specific scripture that says exactly what I'm telling you, because sometimes it's not so cut and dry. Sometimes there are doctrines that are in the scriptures. They're clearly in the scriptures, but it never says it word for word exactly what I'm saying. But if you read those scriptures, you'll see very clearly that that's what God is saying. And so I don't want to be held back either. I want to go forward with the scriptures when they provide insight. And I don't want to be held back because somebody says, exactly where does it say that word that you mentioned? Well, it doesn't have to. And God says also in Deuteronomy 29, 29, continuing on, it says, the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So there's a lot revealed in this word. I don't want to hold back from that. Oh, nobody knows the answer to that. Well, it's in here. Somebody does know the answer. God has spoken. If God has spoken on a subject, we can read it. We can know it. And we can proclaim it. And we should. 
This morning, I'm going to lay down a foundation, or I hope to lay down a foundation, for understanding what comes next. So this is kind of the, the first in, in a couple of uh, talks. But before I do that, I want to just define what it means to say God created for his glory. In simple terms, what does it mean God created for his glory? Because we often hear that word glory, God's glory. What, is he, what does that mean? God created so that his invisible attributes, qualities, and nature might be known outside of himself. That's what it means. You see, God is glorious. He's wonderful. And he knows that, but no one else knows that. He is the invisible God. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to display that wonder of himself so that others outside of himself might see that. Well, part of the reason why you need to create if you're God is because there are no others outside of yourself. There's God and there is no other until he created. And then he wanted to share himself with us, with those objects of his love. He wanted us to know how gracious he is, how merciful he is, how loving he is. Our God is great. Please turn with me. This time I'll give you some time to turn, actually, uh, to John 17, 3. And I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. And this is a question I used to pose to my children as they were growing up over and over again because it took that long to get them to, to remember it. And even now, as, as adults, I hit them if they don't get the answer right. But it says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. If the goal of our salvation is eternal life, and that is the goal of our salvation, eternal life, then based on this passage, it follows that our chief objective is to know God through Jesus Christ. We see that eternal life is not found in the length of time. I'll often hear this, eternal life means live forever. And yes, it does mean live forever. We will live forever. But, you know, even the wicked will exist forever. They will exist in the fires of hell forever. Eternal life is a quality of existence. It's not a length of existence. You see, you can exist in eternal death. That's a poor quality of existence. Or you can exist in eternal life, knowing God and being intimately connected with him. That's what eternal life is. It's having a good quality of existence. To know God, not to be separated from his goodness, not to be separated from his power, not to be separated from his care. That's eternal life. That's what we're after. And that's why it begins here in this life. It begins here in this life because we come to know God. We come to experience him in our walk in, with Christ. Now, it is true that when we leave this earth, we'll come to know God in a far more intimate, fuller way than we know him now. Now we see us in a, in a glass, and I think what they really meant was the, in, in, a, in like a polished piece of metal. You can see, but you can't see it so clearly. But then we'll see face to face. We'll be with God. Amen. But we begin it here. We want to experience God in our lives, not to have a whole bunch of head knowledge about God, but know him. Now, let me clarify that too. <laughs> you can't really know him without knowing the things about him. That's how we come to know him. But we don't stop there. You know, you do need to look through the telescope to see the stars. But you don't stop at the end of the telescope. You look through to see what is being magnified and shown. So we need to look through all of this theology. You need it, but you look through it to see who's behind it. God created for his glory to make himself known. 
The essential quality of relationship with God through faith, knowing God and being known by God, is also expressed in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus is quoted as, as, as saying, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare, and this is Jesus speaking, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, this is about a relationship with God. To know God and to be known of God, that's what salvation's about. That's what eternal life is about. It's not about works. It's about understanding God's grace, believing God so that it might be credited to you as righteousness, believing in the truth about God rather than believing the lies that Satan tells us, believing in the truth about God when you're going through very difficult times. I, I often say to my wife that when we're going through difficult times, we have to keep in mind God is good. God loves me. God is aware of what I'm going through. God cares about me. God is never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. All those things are true. Despite the fact that I wish this would pass away, go away, that this would end. Why does God let this in my life? Why? Because it's for his glory that he might be seen. Even Jesus Christ at the, um, before he went to the cross, he prayed, God, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. Because for God to be glorified, for God's purpose to be done, for us to come to know who God is, truly know who God is, that was necessary. And on a smaller scale, but just as important in, in our own individual lives, very often, the thing that you're going through, it can't pass away. Because God must be revealed to you and to others who see what's happening. Not just what you're doing, but what God is doing. I think about the story of Job. Job was minding his own business, worshiping God and being faithful. And Satan comes with the other angels to present themselves before God. And Satan was walking around back and forth on the earth. But he didn't go to God and say, God, you know, I noticed that guy Job that you got down there. Satan didn't speak of Job. God did. You're walking back and forth on the earth, Satan, huh? Have you considered my servant Job? God wanted to display something in the life of Job. Something about himself, what he baked into the life of Job. The kind of faith that's real. The kind of faith that's sustained even through those kinds of hardship. He wants it displayed in our lives. Our lives should display the faith that God has given us. That it's real, that it's genuine. It's not fake and it's not superficial. We're not churchgoers. We're children of the Most High God. Amen. Our God is good. All right, now that you know where we're, we're going, I want to start off by talking about who God is in a more um, detailed way to explore some of the attributes of God and his character and his nature that he is displaying both through creation and in creation. I think it's very important that we understand this as we talk about the individual aspects of God's personality, if you will, and his attributes, his abilities, and who he is. It says in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So God is not a bundle of conflicting uh, uh, ideas and emotions and all of his attributes work together. 
It's seamless. God is one. He's not at war with himself. He's comfortable in his own skin, though he doesn't have skin. God's goodness is reflected in his justice. God's goodness is reflected in his love. God's goodness is reflected in his wrath. God's goodness is reflected in all aspects of who God is. God's love works together with justice. When we see Jesus Christ on the cross, we only think about God's mercy. He's merciful. He's forgiven us for our sins. But you know what? We also see his justice working. Your sin, my sin, must be atoned for. It must be atoned for. Even when Jesus Christ was the stand-in for my sin, it must be atoned for. We don't have a God who says, well, you know, that's my son. And I know he's a stand-in for your sin, but it's my son, so I'm going to let him slide. God's justice demanded that our sin be atoned for. And so we see on the cross, God is a just God, willing to give up all he is in order to satisfy his justice. God is a God of love. What kind of love drives God to leave his perfect throne, to come down here, humble himself, become a man, suffer and die for us as we're in rebellion against him. We don't want to know anything about him. He wants to show himself to us and we don't want to know anything about him. And at that moment, Jesus Christ comes and dies for our sin. God's love is being displayed. God's mercy is being displayed. And his grace is being displayed. You know, he didn't just say, I forgive you for your sins. Okay, now go on your way. But he opened the door. He said, come and be in my family. You know, we read about the, the prodigal son comes home. He thinks he's going to be a servant in his father's house. He says, no, you get that guy some slippers. Get that guy a ring. Put something on him because he's my son and he's come home. He received him as a son. God receives us as sons and daughters. He says that we are co-heirs with Christ. That's not just mercy. That's the kind of lavish grace that we just haven't experienced any other way. Our God is good. <laughs> Our God is good. God is eternal. And I'll start there because that is the beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Before all things, there was God. Before anything was created, there was God. As it is said in Psalms 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God transcends time. He existed before time and continues to exist after time is no more. God exists forever in the present. He is the great I am. He's not the great I was. He's not the great I will be. He's the great I am. And if you just meditate on that, think about that. Think of what that means. He transcends time. You know, for God, it's not like, okay, over here, he said, let there be light. And there was light. And then some time went by. And then over here, he said, I'm going to bring about a flood. And then over here, you know what? That's God's purpose and his will unfolding. That's what, what we see. We see it unfolding like that. But you see, God just holds it up in his hand like this. It's all here. It's all on the scroll. It's unfolding. But in God, you see, he sees that moment where he said, let there be light. It's just as fresh to him in his view as when he said, I'm going to bring about a flood. It's just as fresh in his mind and in his view when he said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him on the hill, on the mountain. 
It's just as fresh in his mind when Jesus Christ was dying on that cross. It's just as fresh in his mind when you and I were born. And it's just in fr as fresh in his mind as if it were all happening at this one single moment, the day he greets us in glory. That's why when Jesus Christ died, he died for sins past, present, and future. Because in God's mind, there just is. There just is. When Jesus was dying, he was dying for the sins I'm committing today. And God was very much aware of them. So much aware of them that Jesus had to die to atone for them. So much aware of them that the father turned his back on the son because of what I did years later. Hopefully not so much what I'm doing in the future. <laughs> so God is eternal. And we should think about what that means that he's eternal. Like I said, it, it's simple to say God's eternal. But when you think about that, he is forever in the same moment. All things. He transcends time. He knows what's happening in the future. Not just knows it like we can forecast the future. He lives it. He lives in the past, the present, and the future. He is always in the now. He is the great I am. I am. God is self-sufficient. God is self-sufficient, not depending on anyone or anything outside himself. He was not lonely before creation. He had perfect union in the Godhead, that triune Godhead, Holy Spirit, Son, and Father. He didn't need anything. He didn't need anything. In uh, Acts 17.25, it says, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives, sorry, he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God wasn't creating, like sometimes people have this weird idea that God loves praise and he feeds on praise and he looked around, there was no one to praise him, so he created us so that we could praise him so that he could feel good. He didn't need us to feel good. He didn't need us to feel good. He didn't need anything from you or I. What he wanted to do was to give of himself because he is the source of all goodness. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. God is good all the time. And God is holy. God is holy, unique, separate, and distinct from everything else. In Isaiah 46, 9, he puts it this way. For I am God and there is no other. God is truly in a class by himself. You know, they say there's other gods, these false gods. To be honest with you, that's tortured use of the word God. Because there are no gods. There's only one God. Only one God, and there is no other. Isaiah 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says, In the year that King Uzziah, I'm sorry, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, for the whole earth is full of his glory. In his holiness, God is perfect, flawless, pristine, excellent, supreme, matchless, and transcending all else. In his holiness, God is morally pure. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. God is holy, separate, and apart from the very things that he's created. But he's also perfect in that separation. God loves, but God does not merely love. God is love. It's his very nature. He is love. All of God's divine character is bathed in his love. 
John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is love. Do you want the definition of love? God. You want the definition of God? Love. God is immutable, unchanging. God is unchanging. James 1.17 tells us every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of changing or turning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Since God is perfect from everlasting, change could never make him more perfect or add to his excellence. He's in a perfect state. That's why he's unchanging. He can't get better. But you know what else? God is not subject to corruption either. He can't be corrupted by evil. He can't be corrupt, corrupted by time. He can't be corrupted by misuse. God is incorruptible, so he doesn't change. He is perfect, and he stays perfect. Do you know anything in this world that stays perfect? Either it's getting perfect or it's getting unperfect. But God is perfect. And he stays perfect. And that's a great thing for us. You know, could you imagine you put your trust and faith in a good God, a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God, and then you go up one day to pray to him and he says, you know what, I changed. It's not me anymore. I'm tired of you guys. You know, he doesn't change. Because God transcends both space and time, he is everywhere present at all times. He's omnipresent. But I think it's better to say that his presence isn't limited by location. Because sometimes when you say he's everywhere, oh, God is here, he's in the lamp, he's in the glass of water, God, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is that God isn't defined by space. God defines space. Now, I don't want to take away from particularly some of the Old Testament scriptures and the idea that God does present himself in a particular place because he does that sometimes through his Shekinah glory. He does that. That doesn't limit him to that space, though. It means that he's manifesting himself there for a particular purpose. You know, we're in this room. We're all in this room, right? Now, in some senses, I can say I'm all in this room. I'm not just here, I'm all in this room, because I'm attention, I'm present in this room. But I might stop for a moment and give you my attention, and now I'm there. But really, I'm still the same place I was always. And God does that sometimes, and I think that's important for us to understand. God is always with us, too. He said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. But I don't know if you've experienced it, but there are times when God's in your life in a very powerful moment. He's always there. But you feel his presence sometimes in a way that you don't always feel. it. Sometimes you'd have to say you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and you, words come out of your mouth and you go like, where did that come from? Yeah. Or ideas come into your head and you know, where did that come from? I was overwhelmed and all of a sudden, wow, God overwhelmed me and overwhelmed the situation. But God is everywhere present. In Jeremiah 23, verses 23 through 24, God asked, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far away or far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? You can't get away from God's presence. God's here and he's there. And he's not limited by time or space. He transcends them both. And God is omniscient. And remember, I'm saying all these things so that we can reflect on how great God is. Not just say God is great, but reflect on how great God is. Who is this God that we worship and why do we worship him? Because he's worthy of our worship. Our God is worthy of our worship. How could we know him and not worship him? That's not possible. If you don't worship God because you don't know God, 
And there are people who don't want to know God. They hide from him. They pretend all kinds of things so they cannot know God and be confronted with the purity and truth of who God is. But if you open your eyes, you open your heart, you open your ears to receive God's revelation of himself, you cannot not praise him. It is the natural response to knowing God. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the intimate details of everything in all creation. Proverbs 15.3 tells us, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And Hebrews chapter 4.13 we read, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In Psalm 147, verses 4 through 5, and I'm reading all these scriptures because I want you to know that some of the things I'm saying, I'm not just making stuff up, you know. I, I'm trying to make sure that what I'm saying is biblical. And I want to make sure that what I'm saying is not my idea. What do you care about my ideas? I'll be honest with you, I don't care about my ideas. Some of them are foolish. And so I, I really, sometimes even when I'm... I'm, I'm I'm coming up here to preach. I, I struggle because I recognize that I am not capable of having anything worthwhile to say. Not really. And if God doesn't help me, then you guys get nothing and I get nothing. And God doesn't get the glory. So anyway, in Psalm 147, verses 4 through 5, it reinforces the idea of God's omniscience. When it says, he counts the number of the stars. Do you know how many stars there are? He calls them all by name. Not only can he count them, oh yeah, that star, so-and-so, and that star, so and He also can name them. The fact that he can count them and that he can name them, I, I even think it's marvelous that not only can he name them, but he gave them names. That was some chore. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite, without limit, without limit. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, strong. And I don't know why everybody makes fun of Rich, but I, I figure I join the crowd. <laughs> He's stronger than Rich, <laughs> who I just marvel at sometimes. The, the stuff that you do at your age, I just like said, man, I just wish God let me be that strong when I'm that age. <laughs> but he's omnipotent. There is nothing too difficult for the Lord to do. His power is only limited by his divine character. And that's the one thing God can't do. And he can't do it not because there's an outside force stopping him. He can't do it because he doesn't want to. <laughs> He can't do it because he doesn't violate his own nature, his own character. He doesn't do it because he restrains himself. There's nothing that God can't do except what he won't do. It says in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, we read, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? And let me tell you something. That's a word that comes out of the mouth of an ungodly king, Nebuchadnezzar after dealing with God and seeing God. And God is sovereign. God is sovereign in the sense that he is absolutely free to do anything he pleases, remember, constrained by his own nature, and is constrained only by his own divine nature. He is the absolute authority over all creation and is answerable to no other authority. Not only does he have the power to rule, but he has the right to rule. And that's so important to understand. God isn't bullying others, pushing his weight around, throwing his weight around. 
God has the right to rule. In this world, we have a lot of people who can uh, impose their will, but they have no right to do it. Guy walks into a store and holds it up. Give me your money. But you don't have a right to have it, but I have a gun. So you can see that a lot of times, even in countries, bullying other countries, invading a country, taking over a uh, part of a country. Well, you have a right to do that. But I have a bigger army than you. You know, it says right, uh, uh, might makes right. That's a worldly, corrupt worldly view. God is rightly in control. God has the authority. God is righteous and God has the right to rule. He has the right to rule. He also has the power to rule. It says in Romans uh, chapter 11, verses 34 through 36, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, tells us that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. His will. God is good. You know, think about that for a moment. Could you imagine if God was not good? Think about that. All the things that we've said already. Suppose we had this all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God who was evil. Wow. There would be no getting away from it. We have a good God. We should be thankful. We should reflect on that. We should say to ourselves, God, you know, I'm so glad you're good. Because you are so powerful. You see into every corner. You know everything. Could you imagine if we didn't have a merciful God? There'd be no, no hope for any of us. Think about it. If we had a God who wasn't gracious, you had to earn everything with him. How could we earn it? How could we earn it? But God is good. And God's goodness is seen in all his other attributes. God is good in everything he says, does, and is. God's sovereignty is good. God's knowledge is good. God's love is good. God's wrath is good. He doesn't just throw his wrath around everywhere. When God displays his wrath, it's for a good cause. God is good all the time and in every way. Psalm 34, 8 exhorts us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And God's merciful too. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there because I realize my time is gone. But I just want to just reiterate this fact. We need to reflect on who our God is to truly worship him. And we need to understand how valuable it is to know God before we'll understand anything else I say from now on about why God created. How important it is to know him. How blessed we are to know him. But God is merciful. He's the creator. I think about creator, and I'm not going to go too long in that, but just creator. You know, there was not a plan here that, that God could look up, you know, in a dictionary somewhere or on the Internet, go on the Internet, a plan for creation. You know, it came out of his own mind. God is creative. You think about all the, the stuff that we could see by virtue of uh, light bouncing off of objects and that some objects uh, emit some parts of the light and keep other parts of the light so we see different colors. And that's how come we can appreciate, Susan, we can appreciate artwork. We can appreciate a rainbow. That sound, that there's such a thing as sound, God came up with that idea. And he gave us ears too so we could hear it. So that when Linda plays, we get to hear music. We get to hear music. Think about it. This is all because of God. God is a creator. He's wonderful. He's a wonderful being. He's gracious. He's long-suffering. Sometimes we hate the fact that God is so long-suffering. I don't mind he's long-suffering with me. I just really don't like him when he's long-suffering with you. 
you know, because sometimes you just say, God, when are you going to get fed up with this enemy of mine or that enemy? Of, why do you let these people do this or that or the other thing? And God can just look at us and go, come on, come on. You know, sometimes like when we watch with our kids, they're growing up and they do all, John might say, look at his son, Nico, look what he does. John, come on, look at what you did. <laughs> So I want to finish um, by, I guess, wrapping it up the next time I'm here, next Sunday, uh, talking about who God is just a little bit more. And then we're going to go into more uh, depth about uh, why God created. So I'm going to stop here, and if you'll join me in prayer. God and Holy Father, we are so grateful for who you are. And we are tremendously grateful that you, Lord, expressed yourself in creation in a way that we could come to know you, that we could come to see the invisible God, that you are a God of grace, of mercy, of love, of great passion and faithfulness. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And we pray that you would continue to reveal yourself both to us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.